The house they lived in was called Colenso. It was in a suburb of London near Wembley and was shaped like a wedge of cheese. The red, jerry-built roof sloped at a sharp angle, which had been thought artistic in 1920. All the houses in the road had the same kind of roof. They were semi-detached. The road was called Laburnum Avenue. Each house had a rectangular strip of garden behind it, 60 feet by 30 feet, with wooden fences between them. They were cultivated in different ways. Some of the slatterly ones just had long grass and poles to hang out the washing. But many of them were proud of themselves and tried to be better than their neighbours. The garden of Colenso began at the top near the house with a small strip of lawn carefully mowed. Then there was a neat patch of gooseberry and raspberry bushes with three apple trees. Next there was a bed of potatoes and peas. At the bottom of the garden there was a chicken house with eight hens in it and a little shed where Mr Bryant did his carpentry. In the summer there was a fancy garden hammock or swing seat on the lawn and some croquet hoops. Everything about Colenso was beautifully kept. The linoleum in the hall and on the stairs shone with a wax finish. The brass bowl in the sitting room window, with a fern in it, was polished twice a week. Nobody sat in the sitting room, unless there were visitors. And then some imitation Crown Derby china was brought out for tea, while the visitors perched on the hard, tight, clean, drayed chairs, which smelt of new cloth and furniture cream. The kitchen, where the family life was really lived, was as shiny as the sitting room. The grate was black leaded every day and its brass bits gleamed with brasso, as did all the knick-knacks, like copper letter racks in the shape of galleons, toasting forks with the Lincoln imp on them, bits of metal off the harness of cart horses, miniature candlesticks bought as souvenirs with the arms of seaside towns in enamel, and a bellows in beaten brass showing a lighthouse and some seagulls. The pots and pans and kettles were speckless. There was a special mat and scraper in the scullery where Mr Bryant had to take his boots off when he came in from the garden. Mrs Bryant was an ex-school teacher and had married her husband for the sake of being married. She was a house-proud Lancashire woman who had a faint moustache and rather a wild, avid look, as if she might go mad at any moment. She was inclined to be the life and soul at Christmas parties, she jollied people along in a loud, funny voice, crying, "Ee!" and Bye! A sort of imitation Gracie feels with the same kind of screech. And she ordered everybody to sit down or stand up or hide in cupboards or take a pencil and write down the names of twelve fish beginning with W. Under this veneer of camaraderie, she was as hard as nails. She allowed her husband to have a bottle of stout with his meals. It kept him out of the pubs. And she cooked for him superbly. But he had to sleep in a separate bed because of hygiene. And she had taught him to believe that all males were beastly. They had no children. Mr Bryant, she had married him rather late in life, when it turned out that there was nobody else available, was in one way a source of shame to her. He was... A sewer man. For this very reason, he washed himself so thoroughly before he came home, he was cleaner than most other people in the Burnham Avenue, but she didn't let him forget that she had married beneath her and that she was a cultured person whose father had been a farmer while her husband was low enough to work in drains. They were far from being unhappy together. Most marriages are desperate affairs sometimes when the glamour has worn off. But these two did have a clean, comfortable, warm home, with excellent food, and a loyalty to each other which was based on economics. Mr Bryant was a stocky man going bald, with thick foxy hair on his forearms, and he wore an apron when he was doing the washing up. He had his own hobbies, which he conducted in the shed at the bottom of the garden. He had a project, or daydream, about adapting the shed so that he could keep racing pigeons in it. Also, he was a Freemason. When they listened to the radio, he often wished that they could have the boxing commentaries. But Mrs Bryant preferred the readings from Dickens 
or one of the diaries which go on and on in England as serials. The diary of a doctor's wife, or an everyday story of country folk. One evening, while they were listening to the radio, there was a talk on the third programme about imaginary children. It told about Charles Lamb, Kipling and Sir James Barry, who had all three written about childless people, and how their characters consoled themselves by daydreaming of the babies who had never existed, about the might have beens. It was Mrs Bryant who suggested they might invent a baby for themselves. The idea did not appeal to her husband at first, but he didn't oppose it, and after a bit he caught on with surprising imagination for such a humdrum man. Perhaps he needed a son more than he knew. Their idea was to imagine a baby and to let it live on day by day, having the adventures which it would normally have had if it had been a real one, just like a baby on the radio serials. Both of them preferred a boy. Mrs Bryant was a thorough woman, and she insisted on going through the whole procedure from the beginning. She only announced her pregnancy after three months, when she was quite sure, and she speculated about sex and names and provided herself with a layette, pink or blue, for the full time before she consented to present her husband with the expected heir. The delivery was a normal one, and the boy was born on the 25th of April. They christened him Arthur, after Mrs Bryant's father, and Pendlebury, after a distant cousin who had risen to be a general. He was a healthy specimen, weighing nearly eight pounds, and Mr Bryant was amazed by his mauve colour, his wrinkles, his bedraggled hair, and the perfection of his fingernails. When he remarked that the baby was mauve, Mrs Bryant was furious. She said that all babies were this colour, which was not mauve, and for a whole evening there were strained relations in Laburnum Avenue. They were model parents devoted to the little life which they had conceived between them, and from the start they were determined to make it a successful one. Mr Bryant gave up having stout with his meals and actually put the money, which would have been spent on it, real money, into a teapot on the mantelpiece, afterwards investing it in savings certificates whenever the teapot was full. Mrs Bryant proved to be a good mother, though a bit fussy and dainty, as was natural in a school teacher. Mr Bryant often chided her for coddling the boy. She was a fanatical steriliser and boiler of things. As the child grew older and survived the countless hazards and small troubles of infancy, the teething, the difficulties about food, he absolutely refused to eat vegetables or fat. And the day when he fell down in the tool shed and cut his forehead on a chisel which had carelessly been left about, Mr Bryant was full of remorse about this. They began to save up still more for him, again in real money, because Mrs Bryant insisted on a good education. The pool's money, the stout money, and all sorts of other luxuries were set aside so that the boy could be sent to a preparatory school, as it is called in England, like a gentleman. Mrs Bryant had taught in a secondary school, which, instead of making her know better, had given her ideas about the other kind. She was an innocent creature in some ways. Mr Bryant, who could remember nothing about his own school except a girl called Mabel, accepted his wife's information on the subject. All the same, it was a struggle for them to pay the fees. Luckily, Arthur turned out to be clever. Probably he inherited it from his mother. He won a scholarship to Dulwich College. He was clever, he was healthy, in spite of the usual scares about mumps, chicken pox, etc. He was happy, and this was Mr Bryan's contribution. He was good at games. Mrs Bryant would not agree to his being the captain of the cricket team, but he played in it. All through the summer months, his father kept a record of his scores, grieving when he was out for naught, and disputing the umpire's decision if he was given LBW. Mrs Bryant didn't pay much attention to this, though she was pleased to hear of successes in a general way. They shared the usual disagreements of parents. Mrs Bryant was against corporal punishment on principle, while Bryant was in favour of it. But he couldn't bring himself to do it, so there was no trouble about this. One thing did lead to friction. Mrs Bryant didn't want Arthur to be interested in girls or to do anything that was wrong. 
Mr. Bryant absolutely refused to let him be a mollycoddle. He said that all boys were interested in girls like Mabel. Perhaps it was the girls who made the first rift in the lute. As Arthur began to grow up and to be less dependent on his parents, less in need of his mother's protection, Mrs. Bryant seemed to grow cooler towards him. It was not exactly that she was jealous of the girls. It was more as if she resented his being a male. She didn't like it that he should have a life apart from hers. She lost interest in him as he ceased to belong to her protectorate and even began to disapprove of him, perhaps to fear him for being a man. Mr. Bryant seemed to love him all the more for being one. It was at this point that husband and wife stopped imagining in harmony. Being estranged from the masculine Arthur, Mrs. Bryant ceased to wish the best for him. The point was that she had it in her power not to give it to him. She explained to her husband while they were washing up in the tight, hard kitchen that daydreaming was wrong when it became a wish fulfillment. He didn't know what she meant by this word, but he felt defensive and beleaguered and held the wet cup with a damp clutch in his blunt russet fingers. She said that they were just imagining Arthur to be clever and successful and good at things because they wanted him to be so, but few real people were like that. Bryant was forced to agree that people did not usually turn out to be supermen. He was not one himself. From now on, he fought a long, losing battle on behalf of Arthur, who began to go from bad to worse. The boy did not get a good job. The best they could do for him was a clerkship in a bank. It was badly paid. The inevitable happened, and he stole some money to bet on the horses. Mrs. Bryant had been afraid of this. His broken-hearted parents were working in the oblong garden at Wembley when matters came to a head. There was a patch of neat grass, 30 feet by 15, which Mr. Bryant was mowing. There was the crazy path with Alison growing in it, the border of lupins, the clothesline, some potatoes and scarlet runners, and the small tool shed. The pigeon house had never been finished. Prison? cried Mr. Bryant. Oh, Arthur, he must not go to prison. God is not mocked, she said. What can he do? What can he do when he comes out? We shall have to move. But Arthur never meant no harm. He will find no work as an ex-convict. We shall have to support him forever. Mr. Bryant said, I will get him on the sewers. I can ask Mr. Brownlow. A sewer man, she said bitterly. And then, I suppose, he will marry a school teacher, like you did. Mr. Bryant went to the tool shed for his croquet mallet. He bashed her brains out with it. It only needed one thump. He had to do this in defence of Arthur. He could not afford to have two failures in the family.